Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. So proud of the Endangered Wolf Center for their work on helping to save this national treasure. The medieval world, yes, it was strange, but it's not unrecognizable to us today. I'm really passionate about changing everything for better. Today on Spotlight, a Webster student receives an award from the United Nations, the good deed that caught their eye. Plus, there are less than 20 red wolves left in the wild, how this center is trying to protect them. And then using raw materials to create an interactive exhibit. But first, he puts the evil in medieval, but also shows you its softer side in a new book. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Do you want to see something cool? Like, do you really want to see something cool? Dan Jones gets excited about history. I'll show you something cool. Especially medieval history. I particularly love the Middle Ages because it, it is just a thousand years worth of incredible stories. Stories of brutality and bravery, of tyrants and nobles, religious upheaval and endless border wars. No, this is good. This is good. Do you want to see? Now, historian Dan Jones has taken those 1,000 years of stories and turned them into a new, character-driven 600-page book. So this, my unboxy little friends, is the US edition of Powers and Thrones. This will take readers not only on a trip through the Middle Ages, but will also give them pause and, and space and time um, and reason to reflect on, on the, the world's 21st century. The Middle Ages certainly resonate today when thinking about the pandemic. The later 14th century saw wave after wave after wave of Black Death come back. Very, very serious waves. It also saw wave after wave tracking with those waves of pandemic of populist rebellion, of people questioning the whole basis on which society was ordered. I feel like we've started to see that mood already. So Powers and Thrones, which sounds a little like Game of Thrones, I, I assume that's just Game a happy coincidence. What's, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of it. <laughs> Never heard of it. But Not yours is all see. true. Yours is all true. Yeah, look, I mean, well, come on. Game, Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin drew on the Middle Ages as inspiration for Game of Thrones. Um, I, I had dinner with George a couple of years ago, and we had a... a very entertaining chat about history and about fantasy and about the intersection between the two. Um, the Powers and Thrones is, is the whole of the Middle Ages, just the real stuff, no dragons. And so right under Powers and Thrones, of course, it says a new history of the Middle Ages. What's, right. what's new? If there's, if there's an age that's been written about a lot, it's certainly the Middle Ages. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good philosophical question in a way, Paul. I mean, why do we write history of any event more than once. I think it's it, because history is about a dialogue between past and present. And each generation writes new histories of past times. Now, sometimes that's because new research comes to light. And certainly in Powers and Thrones, you know, I've taken advantage of uh, my researchers, my own researchers and the researchers of um, experts across a thousand years of history into areas like climate change, for example, that we haven't, that haven't traditionally been um, part of medieval narratives, but it's also about about thinking what's important to us in the world today, and how do we go, how do we interpret the past in light of what we're feeling today? So some of the themes. I mean, Powers and Thrones is a narrative history. It's full of big stories, big characters, the the good stuff of the Middle Ages. But it, it has it has underlying themes which just kind of bubble away, themes that should be recognisable in the 21st century. Climate change is one, but mass migration pandemic disease, technological change, global networks, things that kind of itch and nag away at us in the 21st century. I've just, when I've noticed them in my charge through the Middle Ages, I've kind of brought them to the fore. It's a way of saying the medieval world, yes, it was strange, but it's not unrecognizable to us today. Were you trying to redeem it in a way? I mean, another word for the Middle Ages is medieval, which sounds like evil. 
<laughs> some, of it, some of it really <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, Attila yeah, the yeah, Hun, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it seems like you're trying to find some, some good that came out of the Middle Ages as well. No age is either good or bad. A, historical ages are human ages, and human beings are complex, and human society is complex, and human history is complex. So it's not a redemptive history of the Middle Ages. It just does two things. Firstly, it tells all the good stories. I mean, I'm a sucker for a good story. I love a good story. So characters like Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Joan of Arc. It tells the good stories, but it also says, look, this is a world that we can engage with on our terms. You know, we can build a bridge between now and the Middle Ages and see things that we have in common. And we can also see in the Middle Ages the foundations of of what we still recognize as Western society. Scan the QR code on your screen with your phone's camera to watch the full interview and find out why he recorded the audiobook while only wearing underpants. Or just head to HECmedia.org. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. I grew up in Kabul, Afghanistan, but I was born in a small province in Afghanistan. Fahima Bandali said goodbye to her best friends in 2017 as she moved to St. Louis with her family. The first thing she noticed the quiet. When I was going to Afghanistan, uh, going to school in Afghanistan, it was this, this feeling that a bombing attack at any time can happen. The Webster University sophomore knows she was lucky to move when she did, with time to pack her belongings and learn English. She points out refugees fleeing the country now in chaos face a much greater challenge. That was devastating for me to think that they're moving in a country, in a whole new country. The only thing that they have is themselves and their clothes. And, and, and I think that is the obligations of, I, I just felt like it is my duty to raise my voice. Bandali created a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for the thousand plus refugees expected to arrive in St. Louis in the next few months. She also enlisted her history professor to help organize a campus-wide event to raise awareness of the humanitarian crisis. We have a lot of people who gave uh, sweat and blood to help out in Afghanistan, and we also have a lot of immigrants and people who have have ended up in St. Louis over the years. Um, And now both of those communities really want to do what's right and welcome refugees and and make it possible for them to come here. And I think Fahima, right off the bat, saw those connections and realized that, you know, she could play a role as a a bridge to that region and as somebody who is, you know, acutely aware of these issues and could help the community to kind of understand what's at stake and, and also feel involved that they can actually do something. Bandali's actions caught the attention of the St. Louis chapter of the United Nations Association which recognized her as a Mary T. Hall emerging change maker. She absolutely is a change maker. School leaders point out Webster University has long been at the forefront of change, admitting women, minorities, and sight-impaired students well before it was widely accepted. Current students come from 111 different countries. Fahima is a great example of a student elevating conversations on campus. She has this great way of engaging with individuals and wanting individuals to immediately then connect with her uh, and wanting themselves to do better and to know better and to find ways to become change agents and to support her in the work that she's doing and bringing about change. We talk about transformative learning that helps people be individually excellent and global citizens. She lives that. Uh, So her willingness to not only share her story, but to fuel our desire to help others, makes the story of Afghanistan not this far removed story about people halfway around the world, but it makes it through her about people that we know and that we care about. 
Fahima has another project on the horizon, an app that will connect those who want to help with Afghan refugees. You can do uh, a tutoring sessions or you can do just talking because they have overcome a dramatic uh, experience and just talking and listening to them, it helps. She is humble about the recognition she's receiving. But the fact that I'm receiving this award, I didn't thought that this is a award for me because I thought this is this award symbolizes the support that the community is giving to me. Fahima has family in Afghanistan and they are not far from her mind as she studies or works in her school's welcome center. She has big plans for her future as she studies political science and international relations. Because I'm really passionate about community service and creating a better life for everybody and changing everything for better. So I'm really hoping that I go to law school and uh, I'm hoping to pursue congressional law because that is where I can do policy makings and I can have a really impact because I believe that policies are the baseline for justice, for everything, for every good thing in the community. And Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram. The distinct sound of wolves howling isn't something most of us hear very often, if at all. Wolves are endangered and misunderstood. Considered a keynote species, they are essential to maintaining a balanced ecosystem. Wolves in general are so endangered because there's so much information, misinformation out there about them. Um, you think about what you've grown up with. Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Pigs, werewolf movies. They all portray wolves as the big bad wolf. When in reality, they're not like that at all. They're actually very shy. They want nothing to do with people. They run away from people in the wild. And the reason that's so important is because if you fear something, you don't conserve it, right? You don't want to protect it. Regina Masadi is the director of animal care and conservation at the Endangered Wolf Center in Eureka, Missouri. Founded 50 years ago by zoologist Marlon Perkins and his wife Carol, the Wolf Center has nurtured captive-born packs of red wolves, Mexican wolves, maned wolves, and African painted dogs. Restoring the wolf population in the wild is the mission of the center. We just built two new breeding habitats for the endangered American red wolf. That's actually the most endangered wolf in the world. There's only less than 20 left in the wild. And our goal of those new habitats is to help breed the American red wolf and raise wolves that will be successful when they're released into the wild to help that species grow. The enclosures minimize interaction with humans. The goal is for the wolves to remain shy and fearful of people, which increases their ability to survive in the wild. We are so excited because we are about to take two American red wolves to the wild in North Carolina. The center recently released two adult red wolves at a federally protected wildlife refuge. We had a local donor supply the plane that we were able to fly with the wolves and keep an eye on them, make sure they're safe the whole time. When we landed, we worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to put radio tracking collars on them so the biologists in the ground could help keep them safe and keep an eye on them. And we actually got to release them into the wild, into their new, new homes, and it was just one of the coolest experiences that I have ever had um, working here. And I'm so uh, proud of the Endangered Wolf Center for their work on helping to save this national treasure. The center has been successful introducing fostered Mexican pups into established packs in the wild. And what that means is we actually work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the state agencies in New Mexico and Arizona to take pups that are born here and we actually foster them, sneak them into wild dens so that wild parents can raise them as their own, teach them all those important skills, how to stay away from people, how to hunt for dinner, how to defend their territory. It was such a creative conservation tool of essentially looking at that behavior and seeing, okay, they are so nurturing. Let's see if they'll take care of somebody else's pups. And sure enough, they do. Um, they are, we have to do it before the pups are about two weeks old when they're in that bonding period. And so when we're taking these pups down there, they are itty bitty, I mean like potato sized puppies. Their ears are closed, their eyes are closed. We only take part of the litter and mom keeps part of the litter. The Endangered Wolf Center plans to open a new veterinary and nutrition center in the near future. The center offers in-person, group, and virtual tours. For information, visit their website at endangeredwolfcenter.org. Relax with some blues music later on Spotlight. We're at the Sheldon Art Galleries, and we have five new exhibits that will be up through January the 15th. 
I feel that there is a great connection with the exhibits and the artists working with raw materials, real basic materials to come across with their messages and they connect in very subtle ways. It makes a great transition going through each exhibit. When you first come into the gallery spaces, you will see Tate Foley's exhibit in shadow, and it's prints that he has done that are modular, um, using kind of raw materials to create frameworks that can change and alternate the ideas and content of the work. Tate plays with words and color and pushes the meaning of the words with the use of the color and pattern. So the use of raw materials that Tate Foley has used moves on into the next gallery spaces with Brett Williams' sound sculptures. There's one piece per room and the work is focused entirely on sound being the object. The rooms are lit very dark. There's just light focused on the piece that's making the sound. So Brett wants you to concentrate on the sound and how the sound carries through the room and into the next and how the pieces interact with one another. After Brett Williams' exhibit, we move into Carly Slade's and once again using kind of raw materials to create an interactive installation. They're ceramic pieces with battery-operated cars that people are able to control and the exhibit's called Rat Race. In the first room into Carly's exhibit is a ceramic sculpture of an old abandoned apartment building. Um, she comes from a working class background, and so that's very important to her. And it shows with her exploring these houses and seeing people being, you know, on the porches or, you know, activities around the house, and then where it's just isolated and burned out and it becomes a shell, but it still holds the memories of the people that were there. The fourth exhibit is Abby Hefner, and the title of the exhibit is Redacted Landscapes. So Abby has gone through and has photographed aerial views of uh, radioactive sites. So we have those on display as well as her uranotype prints of the waste site plants that house the radioactive waste. And she uses a process called uranotype. So it's using uranium to make the prints. And in her exhibit, we have a Geiger counter with a print and a case, so it's beeping and letting you know that it is radioactive. The last exhibit we have upstairs is Grand Center Arts Academy's visual departments. The work was done virtually for the last year during the pandemic, and it was challenging for the teachers to come up with a program of projects for the students, so they developed packets that they had the students pick up they did uh, virtual demonstrations of each project, and then they also had virtual critiques. So the students were able to interact with one another and give advice how to improve the work, what was good, what can be done better. And they really had a successful year with all the challenges. This round of fall exhibits is very sculptural and interactive, and you take your time to walk around the exhibits and just get a full immersion of what is on display. The artists we have in this round of exhibits are not typically shown in St. Louis, so we're very pleased to have them here. They will be up through January the 15th, and you can find more information on thesheldon.org. Cheers to Clara Walsh, who is attributed with inventing the cocktail party at her father-in-law's St. Louis home. Positively, the newest stunt in society is the giving of cocktail parties as reported by the Tacoma Times on April 17, 1917. This brought the cocktail from the exclusive Gentleman's Club to the home where it could be enjoyed equally by women without reproach. When we last met with Robert and Liza Fishbone, this father-daughter duo had just completed a mural for Urban Harvest. Urban Harvest, that was an incredible project for us and for the client and transformed that particular corner of downtown. And in fact, my daughter and I have continued to transform different neighborhoods, different locations with murals. That one, I'm, I'm just really proud of the painting. I think doing that unlocked some style within me that I hadn't really explored. And so that was really exciting. Robert Fishbone had a long history of painting murals with his late wife, Sarah. 
and it meant everything to us. It's, it, we didn't come to St. Louis to do murals, but that's how our life evolved. And now Robert paints exclusively with his daughter, Liza. My dad has a thing that he always says that we can't only consider what we see, but we have to think about what the wall sees. There's a lot of history there. And so it's our responsibility to consider that history and consider how are people interacting with this space. Whatever we do, we want it to be beautiful. We don't speak to too many social issues, but we feel that what we do has more to do with the human spirit, and that's what we're interested in. We caught up with Robert in front of one of their newer murals in Dogtown. The owner of the building wanted us to do a mural to help uh, unify the community. We decided to basically do a testament to Dogtown, just its name, and the names of the five neighborhoods that make up Dogtown, which are listed on the banners of the mural. We decided to do a large D in the style of an illuminated letter, which you find in medieval manuscripts. And then the cardinal is, you know, we're in St. Louis, <laughs> and the uh, bluebird is actually the Missouri State Bird. And then we just have lovely plants and flowers streaming out from it. Green Street St. Louis sponsored a lot of artworks over the years. Their mission is to bring beautiful housing to the downtown area, as well as beautiful artwork. So they hired on-the-wall productions. When we approached this particular wall, we realized that you know a picture of something was just not going to work because of all the windows. So if you look at the mural, you'll see that on the top left, there are these shapes that are really like shards, like broken pieces of glass or ceramic. But as they move across the wall, they transform, they change shape, they're evolving, they get larger and larger. But as you get all the way to the right side, they become more vertical, and that's where the windows integrate with them very well. A friend of mine described it as they're, they're dancing across the wall. After 10 years of doing murals for Willard Home Products, beginning in 1995, it was time to refresh the murals that were created by Robert's wife, Sarah. Part of me was a little reluctant to restore it because I didn't know if I was like painting it away. And that was really hard for me. And it still is hard for me. But over the years, it starts to feel more like, okay, this is my job. I don't spend too much time in those emotions, partially because it's just like traumatic. <laughs> so I don't live there. And partially because when we're doing them, we're really just focused and trying to, you know, get everything done in a timely manner. It's been a really interesting process because I'm literally retracing my mom's brush strokes. And so I've learned a lot about painting just through that. This past summer, we restored the last one. Plus he commissioned us to do one new one, which is the wall behind me. And it also happens to be what he first sees when he walks out of where he lives across the street. So that's why his, this cat is in it. It was his cat. But the tableau is uh, one basically of Southeast Asia. We've continued the real bamboo onto the wall. And then there's this corporate logo, the Luna Moth, more plants, the cat. And then we decided to turn the truck dock, which was an entranceway, into a different kind of entranceway, into a gateway, leading you down a path. So we, we got a chance to put our own stamp on the work. We got to design one new piece for his collection. After recently finishing a solo project for the Weinheimer Community Center in Highland, Illinois, Robert moved on to a new chapter, creating labyrinths. There's a lot of ways to think about what is an artist. And really what an artist does is we, we interpret an experience. And doing a labyrinth is a, it's a little, little bit different. Instead of like putting stuff out there, we're, we're going deeper within. In some ways it's very different from murals, but in another way it's not. You know, a mural is an escape, you know, from your, from your moment. And a labyrinth is similar, except instead of like, wow, we're slowing everything down. One of several labyrinths he designed was constructed at Villa de Chen, an Oak Hill school. We're creating the labyrinth in the same way that it's used, you know, with a kind of surrender, with a reverence, with a letting go. Um, and it's a profound experience. The primary purpose of this labyrinth is a gift to the campus community. It was the right time uh, and the right response to the call we find ourselves in in the modern day, a place of calm. Robert was given to us as a gift. 
and he's been a gift to me and to this campus community, not only in this experience of building the labyrinth, but because it's a stable part of our campus now, this iconic campus, it'll be a gift for generations to come. Looking for St. Louis-centric videos to use in your classroom? Check out our educational resources at educate.today. In partnership with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, here's Songs of America. Visit slso.org to see more from the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. Next week, the world's first exhibit featuring the newly revised Tyrannosaur Family Tree. Plus, an unforgettable story of poverty, survival, and hope. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.